This is the Jocko Unraveling Podcast, Episode 3, with Daryl Cooper and me, Jocko Willink. Let's keep going. I know where I want to pick up. If you have somewhere, go. you can go first. I want to know what little Jocko, little semen recruit Willink, who joined in 1990, you, you uh, taught us last, week, last episode, you come, into the, you come into the SEAL teams in the 1990s, and uh, if you're a warrior looking for a war, the 90s are a little bit of a dead zone. For the well, you got to remember, partially accurate, but as we already talked about, warrior looking for a war in the delayed entry program through the summer of 1990, as this buildup is happening, I'm thinking I'm going to get exactly what I asked for. And I am super pumped about that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. I think that this, and like I said, I, I, on one of the earlier podcasts, I thought there was, there, there were reports there was 40,000 40, casualties in the first 48 hours. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're gonna need me. <laughs> they're gonna need me to help win this bad boy because I'm young and dumb and ready to rock and roll. So then when it was over, then, then I'm in buds and it's over. In buds and it's over. So now I'm thinking, okay, what's 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 going to happen? And you know, showed up and then it was peacetime, peacetime teams, which is not not what you dream about when you're a when you're a young lad going in the teams, going through SEAL training. You think you're just going to war. And I, I was dumb. And so I was checking into SEAL Team One, and I thought they were going to send me to Vietnam. Like, even though the Gulf War is over, but that's okay. SEALs were right, sneaking around the world, doing stuff right, everywhere. Right. You know, and that's just not true. <laughs> just not true. It, it's it is kind of true now. Right. In fact, I'll go ahead and say it is true now. Like there are things happening around the world all the time. That's the way it is now. That's post September 11th. Pre September 11th, there was there was years. You know, I knew guys that were Master Chiefs that were in the SEAL teams for 30 years. You know, they came in in 1971 and retired in 19, or in 2001, and they never fired a shot in anger. So, yeah, the 90s was, was, not, <laughs> was not good from a perspective of wanting to go to war. And look, man, I'm sorry, everybody, that that that's what I wanted to do with my life. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I guess let's be happy that I didn't want to be a criminal or I didn't want to be a gangster or I didn't want to be a murderer. I, I wanted to be a SEAL and I wanted to go to war. That's the way it was. And, and it, I'm sorry that that's the way it is, but that's the way it is. And, and I can tell you that with something else, I'm not alone. He's not that sorry. Yeah, and, he, and, and I'm not alone. There's all kinds of young men and I don't know where we get it from. I don't know where it comes from. It's part of our instinct is well, to is to fight wars. To tell you where it comes from is when you look at people like Al Qaeda in Iraq who ended up taking over large sections of the country in two thousand four, five, and six. Who do you want to send after them? You know, people have this idea that the American military, because it's so technologically advanced, and we've got all this just access to so many tools and, and toys that other people don't have that. Uh, that our soldiers are sort of like skilled labor, and that's not it's not it's not how, how it works. You know, you need people who are going to go in. You know, unless you're unless you're sort of itching for the fight, um, you're not going to be ready to handle handle the kind of thing that you guys had to deal with over there. Yeah, and it is weird though to think that there's a bunch of people that there that that want to go fight. Like that's a weird. If, if you think about it, you know, from a basic human instinct, right, is survival, right? The self-preservation, that's a basic human instinct. The last job you would sign up for with that instinct is, I'm gonna be some kind of a soldier, I'm gonna go to war. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to understand. Sure. It's a little bit tricky to understand uh, and even if you go, even if you say, well, you know, people fight, right? Like, you know, you go out on a Friday night in downtown, wherever, there's gonna be some fights. And that's the way it is. But, and I guess, you know, out of those out of those fights that break out, some of those people are going out looking for fights. It's just a human instinct. And I think you take that to the next level and you got people like me that, that want to go to war. And uh, again, like, I, it's, 
knowing what I now know about war and understanding it at a deeper level, I, I do say, hey, I'm sorry, that's the way it is. But it's all, also, I'm sorry that that's the reality. And I'm not gonna lie about it. I'm not gonna tell you, oh, you know, when, when 9-11 happened, there wasn't a giant part of me that was saying, oh, cool, now I get to go fight, you know? Oh, yeah, it's t- tragic and horrible, and how dare they, but someone's gonna have to avenge this, and thank God that someone is me and my friends. So well, that, I wanna ask you about that part. So this drive to go to, go to war, I do wonder if some part of it for people is they have an intuition that, um, you know, people love their friends. They got really great friends. And uh, those friendships were usually made great uh, during the most difficult times of those people's lives. The guys who were there for them, you know, through a difficult breakup or whatever it was, those are the times when those friendships get forged. And I think maybe people have an intuition that when you enter into a human experience, with that level of intensity, something like war. It's really not, it's a, it's a level of intense human experience. It's not really accessible to most people in, in any way in their normal life, unless they're a criminal. Um, that you're going to experience that, for, for you, was it that you wanted to go to war? Was there some part of you that like, you were gonna go to war with your friends? And you were gonna be part of this thing with other people were you, were you cognizant I, of that? I appreciate you throwing out some nice little bait softball to thing to, to, to make you. me sound like I had this altruistic thing of going <laughs> to war with my friends. And b- way before I had any friends, you know, in the military, I still had that feeling. All right, that's yeah. the last time I'll pander to you, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate you trying to, me look, trying to make me look like a good human. But, hey, man, let's face it. There's, there's, there's a group of humans that have... I mean, every person has some sort of natural proclivity towards something, right? And I've said this before. When, you, when, when some people are walking around as a 10-year-old and they see a, a businessman in a suit with a briefcase, they think that looks cool. Like they think that guy's got power, that looks cool. They see someone else, they, they see the fireman and they go, that looks cool, I wanna do that. They're, they see an astronaut, they go, I wanna fly into space, or they see uh, whatever, you name the occupation, and there's people, and you know, at, at Echelon Front, I work with people that w- love doing their job, like that's what they love doing. You love your job, right? That's what you love doing. It's sure. like, okay, cool. Guess what? Um, my natural thing was I really wanted to do, do this job, and, <sighs> You weren't going to be a model, so I definitely wasn't going to be a model, and 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 uh, you know I I don't know that I really would have been so um, I wouldn't have been so com- I don't know that I could have been as committed as I was to anything else. I can't imagine trying to tr- trying to, to to have some other job that I would have been this committed to. Now I learned through the military and through the SEAL teams that commitment was a good thing and that I could kind of fake commitment. Like I fake, when I went to college, the Navy sent me to college from 2000, and, from 2000 to 2003. And when I, went, when I went to college, I faked that I was into it and I did really well. Why? Because I made it my job. And I guess that was still tied into, you know, uh, I guess, no, I guess it's, I was gonna say it's tied into SEAL teams, but that was just, a lot of it, that was just ego. I'm gonna be number one. That's me, I'm gonna make this happen. Part of it was ego versus the, the professors. Oh, you think you're smart, cool. You give me any, ask me any question about your little test and I'm gonna know it. And that's, that's what I, that was the attitude. I made it into a game, I was my ego, driven by ego and you know, that's not a bad thing, right? I'm not saying it was my ego and I should've put, no, 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 I, my ego helped me do well in college. I didn't want to get shown up by a professor, I wanted to, be to 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 go to battle with my professors and win, you know. So that's what I did. And so there are some false starts in the '90s. I think I remember you saying before that you were on a ship off the coast of Africa while Rwanda was going on in yep. 1994. Yep. And so there might have been some times where you thought maybe this is my yeah moment. Well, that maybe the, this is my moment. and and prior to that Somalia I was sitting off yeah. the coast of Somalia that same deployment we had our gear loaded it was the first time I loaded out like we loaded out our weapons 
um, loaded out our gear, had our web gear filled with ammo and grenades, and you know we were ready on that one. Is it ninety three? This was in or, this was in ninety four. Okay, ninety four. So I forget what had happened, but there was you know something was going on in Somalia, and this is after we had pulled out. It was yeah, or maybe we were in the process. I think we were in the process, but whatever had spun up had spun up, and I mean, it's, it's actually surprising. If you would have asked me this pre nine eleven, I would have told you the entire the entire enemy order of battle. Yeah. I would have known everything, and it's just sure. because that was one time. Yeah. My whole, and now I can't. Even, I literally can't even remember right now what was happening, you know. And if it wasn't for Rwanda being this massive genocide, I probably wouldn't remember that either, because we were spun up to go on that one, and we didn't go and do anything. And you are just spending that decade just sharpening the edge, and then Tuesday morning, nine thirty or so in the morning, I guess it was. I was on the East Coast. I was actually just over by Arlington at the time when it happened. It would have been early in the morning here, but you get up at four thirty, so. You would have uh, been aware 9-11 happens. And not only are we going to war, but you are being fed an enemy that there's not a lot of ambiguity here. This guy's flying planes into civilian buildings. Um, You're not being asked to go invade Vietnam for maybe a reason that half the country doesn't understand. This This is a bad guy. And you're, what's your rank at this point? What are you in 2001? In 2001, I'm a lieutenant junior grade, okay. so I had been commissioned. I got commissioned in 1998. I did a tour at SEAL Team 2, and at SEAL Team 2, I promoted from ensign to lieutenant junior grade, and I pr- promoted to lieutenant junior grade. It was, it was like the day I left, so I was, I was only at SEAL Team 2 for two years, and then lieutenant junior grade, and then they, the Navy sent me to college. I hadn't been to college yet, and then while I was in college, I automatically made lieutenant, but I hadn't made lieutenant yet. So yeah, I was a lieutenant junior grade going to college. Yeah. And so you are, 9-11 happens and you're a SEAL officer and you're ready to roll. You've been sharpening the edge for 10 years almost, or I guess it would have been about 10 years yep. at that point. And uh, do you have in your head the first Gulf War a little bit, like this thing's going to be over before uh, I get out of school? Absolutely worried, absolutely scared that I'm going to miss it. I called the officer detailer who was a friend of mine who um, I said, hey, you know, sir, pull me out of college. Because I was in college and I still had two more years of college left. Mm-hmm. Like it was, I was graduating in 2003. And I said, and this is a nightmare for me. This yeah. is a nightmare. So You don't want to be one of the SEALs who didn't, uh, who doesn't have any combat when it, everybody else goes. It, yeah. It's a nightmare. And so I called this the SEAL detailer who is who is a friend of mine. I had worked for him. He was a great guy. And I said, Sir, please, you know, please just get me out of school. I'll get my degree online. I have no reason to be here. I can go. I, you know, I'm ready. And he said, and I This was in Afghanistan or when Iraq was coming up? This was like September twelfth. Right, right. Yeah, okay. So you is, want to go to Afghanistan or wherever. Wherever we're going, I'm I'm yeah, in. Got like it. you 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 could have told me we were invading. It didn't matter. You could have told me we were invading. Sorry, Denmark. Yeah, Denmark, whatever. I bring it. I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. Um, and <laughs> which, which is interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm saying these remarks like about how excited and fired up and motivated and, and, and dumb I was. And that's why we have leadership, you know? That's why we have leadership. We have leadership, and that's why I, I became a leader. And as a leader, like that's what makes the military work. Is you, you got guys that are ready to chomping at the bit, right? And sometimes you guys got people that aren't chomping at the bit. And and what you have to do as a leader is you have to find the balance. You have to get people, if they're not chomping at the bit, you gotta push them. If they're chomping at the bit, you gotta pull in the reins, you know? And I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's much easier to have guys that you have to pull in the reins on. And I almost always, I almost always produced guys that I had to pull the reins on. I reinforced behavior that was aggressive. That's what I did. So all I had to do is pull the reins because that's a much easier job. It's a much easier job. So that's the way I set myself up. That's the that's the culture that I produced. If you worked for me, I, w- I was pulling the reins on you. And people that, people that needed to be pushed, they weren't really front runners for me and they probably would find themselves in different situations. So when I'm saying 
it's interesting, you know, when I'm telling you, like, look, I would have invaded Denmark. If they put the target on Denmark, I will go. You know, we're, we're joking about that. But that's what you have to think about. You know, when you're in a leadership position, that's what you've got. And especially pre-9-11, this early phase of the war, everybody was worried. And so this is, this is the interesting. So I called my detailer and said, hey, boss, please send me to a team. I'll go to any team. I'll take any job. And he says to me, Jocko, this war is going to last a long time. And I didn't believe him. And I don't even know if he believed himself mm. because all the lessons that you, you know, that you talked about that we learned, unfortunately, hey, we can kick their ass really quickly. They're not, they're not a formidable enemy, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I believe that. And I'm sure he must have had some sense of that. Maybe his sense was that this was going to be a broader, longer kind of global low intensity conflict. And there would be plenty of time for me to do an operation here or an operation there. Because back in those days, I spent most of my career training for an operation. Like if you were lucky, you did a singular real mission. Like like I would have done in Somalia, like I would have done in, in Rwanda had they given us the go. One mission and I would have been totally happy. And so I think in his mind, now that I'm reflecting on it, he was probably thinking, hey, this is gonna be a long global war. It'll last a long time. We'll be striking targets for the next 20 years or the, probably the next, next three or four years, we'll be striking these kind of terrorist targets around the world. That's probably what he was thinking. The other interesting thing about this is, is I was talking to him, him actually, I saw him and his wife uh, a few months ago, several months ago actually, and I was talking about, hey, I remember when I called you after September 11th, and he said, he said, yeah, everyone called me. Uh -huh. So so the reality is, yeah, Jocko was fired up. So as every other SEAL that wasn't at a SEAL team was calling, trying to get to a SEAL team. Well, 97% of the SEALs that weren't at a SEAL team, well, maybe 90% were, that, that were, they wanted to go. Yeah. They wanted to go get in there. So, SEALs had to rework their mission, I imagine. I mean, you guys are, you go to Afghanistan, you're doing mountain warfare. Um, maybe doing some of the higher risk missions, but semi-conventional missions a lot of the time, right? Well, I mean, the, you want to talk about reworking your mission. I had never done any type of vehicle assault until about maybe a month before we left for Iraq. The only time we would use vehicles we would call them helo trucks because it was to simulate a helicopter because you can't always get helicopters for your training evolutions so we would get in the back of a you know a six ton or whatever and uh or a six by and and drive up to a target area and get out and pretend we just got out of a helicopter mm -hmm. we didn't look at it it never even made sense to us that that was like a viable combat system okay. a humvee and it's actually kind of crazy because it's not just, I can tell you right now, and any, any SEAL that says anything different would be full of shit. You know, there was, we had these, this, this uh, vehicle called a DPV, a Desert Patrol vehicle, which was like a, those old dune buggies. It was a dune buggy yeah. looking thing. And like that was kind of a thing, mm -hmm. but it was almost like that was this little specialized thing where if you were going to do a reconnaissance in the desert, very specific, you might use one of those. There was no way we were thinking, hey, uh, a SEAL t assault force rolling down you know, downtown Baghdad in vehicles. We just didn't think of it. We just didn't think of it. And really, our urban combat, combat um, I would say our urban, our assessment of urban combat, not our assessment, but our our idea that we would be engaged in these like, hey, we're gonna be in urban, which is totally ignorant. If you think about it, I mean, it's just totally ignorant. I mean, we would go out and train. Let me put it this way. We'd go out and train for a month in the desert. We'd go train for a month in the jungle. We'd train for three weeks in the mountains. We'd go for a week in the urban environment. Like, we just didn't put it together. And even the, the Somalia experience in 93 didn't really change that at all? <sighs> Not as much as it should have. Yeah. Not as much as it should have. It should have been an eye-opener. Mm. But, you know what? you know what that was? That was one mission. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of, you know, just like I said, you're training for one mission. That was one mission. And it's like, oh, well, that kind of mission probably won't happen again. That was a little, little 
chance encounter that happened to be in a city. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we are going to be ready for these desert patrols, foot patrols. So our, our attitude had to shift very, very quickly, and it did. And, and one of the best things about the SEAL teams is one of our strengths, one of our weaknesses, is that we don't have doctrine, or we didn't. We, ha- we have doctrine now. We didn't have doctrine. And so when we would do, when we would do one of these desert um, raids on a desert target in training, no one would tell us exactly how to do it. We kind of figured stuff out, and, and it got passed down through oral history. And so we, we didn't have a lot of doctrine, and we, therefore, when missions changed for us, we could, we, we still knew how to figure things out. Yeah. That, was the, that was the biggest strength we had, was we could be in a situation and go, okay, here's, here's the adjustments we need to make. How do we make these adjustments? And we could make them. You, and it seems like you guys probably had uh, the expectation of being given a task, and you've got to figure out how to go accomplish that task, rather than kind of being told, you're part of the war. Yeah. And... You're going to be handed some extra high risk, you know, uh, high value uh, missions and so forth. But you're just part of the war, and um, you know your detailer told you to hang on that you'd be getting some action. Little did you know that uh, the civilians up top at the DoD and everywhere else were cooking something up for you. Yeah, because we and I guess I guess it became very evident very quickly that we were going to go into Afghanistan. And so that kicked off, and yeah, that that kicked off very very quickly. Yeah, you know, very very quickly. You know, I think we had we had troops in there by October. October, you know? yeah, pretty so, pretty remarkable how quickly we were able to get people in there with the Northern Alliance and start working on that. Yeah, but it was the same day that the planes at the towers in the Pentagon uh, that people started talking about Iraq in the Defense Department and in the White House. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, they were the ones pushing it early. And it was that day they started talking about, is there a way to connect Iraq with this? Um, they had their own reasons that we talked about in the last episode for wanting that guy out of there. Um, there probably weren't a lot of ways to connect Saddam Hussein. So, so you're, kind of, you're kind of implying mm-hmm. that they're looking to make a connection. Almost, you're almost implying that it was in a, in a disingenuous way. I think that, or, or let me ask you: Is are you implying that I, it was a disingenuous? Yeah, so way? I think that some of the civilians at the high level, specifically Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, Cheney to a degree, um, that they believed there were good reasons to take out Saddam Hussein and go in there and do this, um, and that this provided them an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I do think that. So, so I would agree. Okay, now that you've kind of taken taken that little nuanced adjustment. For me, I would I would say their assessment was what we want is greater stability and we want better security and we don't want any of these areas where these ki- kind of people can fester and grow. We're here, we're looking at Afghanistan, let's look at Iraq too. I, I, you know, and sh- now now you 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 take that attitude and then you overlay that on top of hey, this is the asshole that, you know, did all these things in the Gulf War. This is the guy that tried to kill my dad. Like all these things, you overlay that, and now I, you know, I, I, I get it. Well, what do we learn from what happened in Afghanistan? We, we learn that you can't have big swaths of territory that aren't under the firm control of states, right? Because there's nobody to hold responsible for what goes on there. And um, they become these festering sores. Where do we have problems? Somalia. Afghanistan, um, Mexico in a different way. You know, they don't so much, you know, not international terror or anything, but there's large swaths of groups that are pretty nasty uh, down there controlling large swaths of territory. Um, And we kind of decided that that's not acceptable anymore, to just have these areas that are not really under anybody's control or even worse, um, are a state that is willing to ally itself with terrorists. Um, I think they made some tenuous and disingenuous connections to Saddam Hussein. I do think that, and then I think that there's been people from the CIA and other places who've come out and said that there were some people in the administration who, you know, we would tell them, here's one side of the story, but here's the other side of the story, and they would just ignore mm-hmm. the other side of the story. And, and, and part of that is side. just like, you know, 
confirmation biases right. and the whole right. nine yards and 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 that you, yes, this is where you know we, we started touching on this subject earlier. This is where, as a leader, as a decision maker, you ha- you you have to take the time and do the ho- do the mental homework to really and truly try and understand what the other side of the argument is. And you know, you talked about this when you came on my podcast. You talked about the fact that you, when you re- when you put the podcast together, you want to. Your, your kind of bar that you're trying to set for yourself is that you can empathize with both sides of an argument. And that is a very important tool to have as a leader to not just look at the other side of the argument and say, oh, they're wrong, they don't get it, they don't make any sense. That That is not the right thing to do. And in fact, whenever, you know, as a leader, when you present to me a plan or when I, when you come to me and you say, hey, here's how I wanna solve this problem or here's what I think about this, and I have a different opinion, my immediate reaction is, okay, how is he right? That's my, my, my immediate reaction isn't, isn't how is Daryl wrong. My immediate reaction is how is he right? How is he seeing this? H- how can I be wrong? That's my immediate reaction. So when we, yeah, when I hear reports like that, that, that the attitude is here's what we think. You come in here with your opinion and I'm just going to disregard it because I know better. That's an awful, it's arrogance, it's ego, and it'll drive to bad decision making. Yeah, I think that there were people in the uh, civilian power structure who, uh, you know, they were at mid and junior levels in those same in the same power structure, the DOD and other places during the first Gulf War. They felt a lot of guilt um, over the fact that we had told the Shia and the Kurds, encouraged them to rise up and then stood aside while Saddam butchered them. Um, And they felt that we that we. Uh, besmirched ourselves a little bit by doing that and that we should have taken that guy out then. Um, what I uh, what I what I resent about the way that they handled it early on was I feel like I think that they didn't trust the American people enough to give them the story straight. Rather than laying everything out and saying, look, here's the strategic situation. Here's why we can't let this guy stay here anymore. Here's the you know for for regional stability reasons for um, humanitarian humanitarian reasons. reasons just lay it all out and let the American people make a decision about that. Instead, they kind of gambled on a few things. Now I'll give them like by all accounts, they all believed that he had stockpiles of WMD everywhere, right? And and if that was the case, he's a guy who's perfectly willing to use those in irrational, wildly irrational ways. So if he had them, that's a very dangerous thing. By all accounts, these people weren't lying about that. You know, they weren't making it up. They expected to find them. They were surprised when we didn't find them everywhere. Um, I wish that they had not rolled the dice on making that the uh, the front line of their argument. Yeah, um, uh, for sure. And you know, this is this comes up all the time. You, you got to tell people the truth about what's happening. Yeah. And when you tell people the truth about what's happening, then that 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 will have the ultimate positive um, result. Now, and, and to take that a little bit further, when you are telling people the truth, that means you also tell them the truth about things that you don't know 100%. Mm. Because when you say, listen, we really think, well, this is gonna keep, this is gonna help stability. We can't have these areas where Al Qaeda could train. If they get pushed out of Afghanistan, they can easily come here. We can't allow that to happen. This is an unstable region, by the way. And also there's a strong possibility that there could be weapons of mass destruction there. So do, do we know any of these things 100%? No, of course not. This is what we're thinking. And when you, instead, when you go out there on a limb and you, you know, it's beyond just putting your, all your eggs in one basket because that's one problem. But then the problem was the level of certitude that they gave was because they were trying to sell it. Yeah. It, came across with a lot of certitude. And you know, look, man, when you look at those overhead pictures and you see you see Condoleezza Rice and and General Powell, these, you know, highly respected people in the United Nations and the United Nations are all nodding their head in agreement. Hey man, that's and, and like we we talked about earlier, this is a this is coming from people in Saddam's own people that are saying, "Yes, yeah. of course he has these things." Yes, you, yes, he has them, right? Even with all that, you gotta give yourself an out as a leader 
And the way you give yourself an out as a leader is by not being so egotistical and arrogant that you know something 100%. You know how many things I know 100%? Like almost nothing. There's almost nothing that I know 100%. And I will never, like very rarely will you catch me saying this is the fact. I'm just not gonna say that. Mm. You don't have an out. And you lose trust and confidence with people when you when you express yourself that way. So I always joke with people, I say, if I ever tell you something like 100%, if I ever say, Daryl, this is what you need to do 100%, I'm telling you this, then you should probably do it. Yeah. Because I will not, you, you probably likely will never hear me say anything like that. So those are some mistakes that I, I think compound the, the mistake that you're talking yeah, about. There was an element within some of the brass up in the civilian leadership um, who, it, you know, these, this, is, this is from stories that have come out since then, as people have reported it, including people on the inside, that the decision that we were going after Iraq, it wasn't a debate. What are we going to do? We, we got hit on 9-11. We got to do something about Afghanistan. Where else are our threats? That there were some people in there in powerful places who made the decision. We're going into Iraq, and we're going to figure out how to tie this thing in right. and sell it. What's um, that book by, what is it, Bob Woodward? Woodward's got one, and which uh, what's, the, a what's good the name one. of that one? Uh, I, the, the, I, I'm, the, my favorite one on the early period up until about 05 is Fiasco by Tom Ricks. Yeah, see, I'm, I should have reviewed because uh, you know I'm, I'm trying to think through these things, and I haven't thought about them yeah. for a long, long, long time. Neither have I. You know, so I'm trying to I'm trying to think through, you know, what what like like these players because there certainly were players, and um, a lot of them were there in the first Gulf War, yeah. and we talked about before. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that happened after the Gulf War is the military people, uh, the generals in the first Gulf War, including General Powell, who's now the Secretary of State, who's now quite skeptical of the idea of going into Iraq. He agrees to go to the UN and provide his lend his credibility to the to to, to the salesmanship, but um, he was worried about it, and he was he was counseling caution. Well, he was doing that in the first Gulf War too. He was you know the generals at the time. We're saying we want six carrier strike groups. We want overwhelming force because they were Vietnam guys and they didn't want to get bogged down into a quagmire. And a lot of the civilians who were there at the time in the Defense Department and the rest of the, the power structure were there in the Bush administration in 03. And they're hearing the same thing again from the military. A lot of the military brass is like, wait a second here. You want to do what? They're a little more hesitant. And the civilians, Wolfowitz and them are like, yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. We've heard this before. We just, 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 this is just how you guys are apparently. And since then, they had watched us just take apart the Iraqis in the first in, in the in the Gulf War, use basically air power and some you know and some patrols in Kosovo to achieve a pretty you know pretty good result there. Um, and so now and now we're in Afghanistan, and that hasn't dragged on for 19 years yet. We're just a couple of years into that one, and so we're thinking. You know, I think there were some people who were a little bit blase about it because they had the idea that at this point there's nothing that the American military can't do. Yeah. That there's just nothing it can't do. When uh, when the um, Kosovo thing was happening, it kicked off, and we and I was at SEAL Team Two at the time, and we started dropping bombs, and it like hit the new. I forget the timing of it, but the timing of it played out that it had kind of kicked off, and maybe a you know in the afternoon or something, and. Overnight, you know, we wake up in the morning and there's bombs being dropped and we show up to work and at SEAL Team 2 we have quarters and we're, So we're all standing there and <laughs> and You know, there's a couple basic announcements that come out, you know, and then I'm not kidding like one of the admin girls Gets up and is like hey, we're having the potluck dinner on whatever So it's gonna start at this time, you know families are invited or whatever <laughs> and then one of my buddies um says something along the lines of, and it was kind of like one of those moments where, you know, the young, I think he was an E6 at the time, but, you know, barks out, hey, everyone, potluck dinner aside, it's, we should, we're at war right now, you know? And I was kind of, I, I always laughed about that because even that, you know, we started dropping these bombs and everything. It was really, really distant. And, sure. and again, this is coming from me, all amped up, hoping to go to war, praying for war, blah, blah, blah. And the war, a little war started, and everyone's kind of like, ah, whatever, you know, we're gonna drop some bombs, you know. Uh, it's it seems so regional and so small, and 
and potluck dinner aside, you know, we're at war right now and what was it, 86 day bombing campaign or some, yeah, about that. S- some certain number of days, very, very uh, effective bombing. And, you know, the first time that we kind of looked around and said, hey, maybe we don't need to put boots on the ground to to win, which no one ever said that. And, and even after that, you know, going into the going into Iraq, it was like, oh, you're going to have to put boots on the ground. Still would hear that. But I'm sure some people are going, really? And even the ground forces that the coalition did commit in Kosovo, they were just driving around, showing presence. Yeah. You know, I... um. One of my uh, one of my friends who was in the army said that some some of the people took to calling it dabbing, driving around, uh, and and yeah. So you get up to two thousand three, and um, we're going into Iraq. That decision's been made around the summer of two thousand two. It's a matter of selling it to the people, selling it to which allies of ours we could. Um, we get into early two thousand three, and there are global protests, largest protests in history as far as I know. 30 million people um, participated, massive ones, 6, 8 million people on February 15th or so, much of which, by the way, was, you know, you would think something like that would be a global event. I think most people just, unless they were participating or, you know, knew somebody who knew somebody, they never like there were some protests, but the idea that there were these giant protests, I think most people, that passed right by a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, I, I don't even remember anything yeah. about that. Um, I kind I kind of remember it. I remember you know it was a three minute news story somewhere. That's about it. And we end up going into Iraq, largely because this is what Rumsfeld wanted to do. And let me let me yeah. just jump in real quick. Yeah, because I was going to bring this to present day. What's happening? Something happened right now with the COVID uh, virus. What you just said, right? This is very standard when a war scenario starts to unfold that you are going to get one half, roughly, of the population, even after September 11th, you know, okay, what, 80% of the population after 9-11 said, Afghanistan, they, they had something to do with it, cool, go get them. By the time we fast forward two years, now we're looking at Iraq, and you got at least half the population going, I don't know. And what's interesting about what's unfolding right now, it is March, uh, it is March twenty fifth, twenty twenty. We're like in the in the middle of this COVID virus thing. The country shut down. You know, n- n- not allowed to go out of our houses in California. New York is you know under serious pressure. So the whole country, the economy is at a standstill. That's where we're at right now. Well, when you go to war with Iraq, or you go to war with Afghanistan, or you go to war with anybody. There's a whole group of Americans that raise their hand and say no, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the what the what the cause is. Yeah, you know, even when we were going to take out ISIS, a lot of know, it just has yeah. to do with their own yeah. self conception. Hey, war is just never good, yeah. and so you get <laughs> some level of resistance against the government. Right? There's some level of public outcry against the governmental decisions. And what's been interesting about this, and and I think it's turning a corner right now, is this virus war, there's no resistance. There's no, there's like no, and and I'm starting to see it now, but basically everything, it's total war. If we need to shut down the government, if we need to shut down the economy, it doesn't matter, this is all bad. And look, I don't whether that's the right decision or not. We I don't know yet, but I do know this: there's almost no resistance. And case in point, you have both Democrats and Republicans during a the most dis- divisive time we've had in in a long time in America. I mean, I think you got to go to Vietnam yeah. to 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 have this much divisiveness between. And even in Vietnam, like if you talk to Okay, the civilian populace that was was more devi- divisive than the government was. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. So you know, in the in the city, in New York City, you had construction workers and you had hippies, and they were more they were further apart than the Republicans and Democrats oh, were yeah. at the time. Oh yeah. So so well, right now it's the opposite. Actually, most. Americans are closer together. It's the government officials. Mm, yeah. It's the Republicans and Democrats that are so, so, mm. so separated. Yeah, that's interesting. 
until you throw this war against a virus, and then all of a sudden, it's all hands on deck. We're all moving in the same direction. Now, there's been some disruption now because this bill came through and the Democrats, you know, the Republicans put forth a bill, Democrats came and added a bunch of, uh, a bunch of things that they want to it, and you, so we've got a dispute going on now. But broadly, all I'm saying is, we have a situation right now where there's no, re- there's very much, much, much less resistance than the government is used to. It was kind of shocking how rapidly we decided we were okay with that. I'm, and again, I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. I don't know. I'm not that guy. I'm not the expert on how to handle an epidemic. But if you would have asked me a couple months ago, what would it take for whole states to just accept being told to stay in their homes for an indefinite period of time? I would have said millions of people would have to be dying in the streets. Otherwise, no way we would we would accept that. But it kind of goes to show you, for, for as much as we like to complain when pollsters call us up and ask you, like, what do you think of the government? What do you think of the media and all these other institutions? And we say, oh, I hate them, 10%, you know, 5% approval rating. That I think this kind of shows, like, the ease with which we handed over pretty authoritarian powers to the government because – the media told us there was something out there that was scary. And I'm not saying it's not scary, but that was the information we had. Yeah, is that a couple hundred people had died. Shows that we actually do have a little more faith in our institutions than we like to pretend sometimes, I think. I think the other thing that made this a little bit of a per- perfect storm is you had a lot. Not only did you have alignment between the people in the government, you had alignment between the two political parties. And then you had this high level of alignment between social media Mm-hmm. And the real media, mm-hmm. you know, instead of there being, you know, wha- wha- you know, uh, you c- instead of finding these extreme views, hey, COVID's nothing. Like after, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you weren't really allowed to say that, you know, because early on there's people going, it's just a flu. Who's going to get it? I don't care. Th- that got shut down real quick, and all of a sudden you had the the media, the the big the big media, and the social media all aligned with. This is the plague, and we better get it under control. It was interesting to see how the social media kind of mob mentality that is usually mobilized for political correctness issues and things, very quickly those same networks got mobilized for this. For sure. And it was interesting to see how that works. And I, I don't know if maybe that's the first time that it's jumped, you know, kind of jumped issues like that. <laughs> yeah, it's but, crazy to watch. Yeah. It's crazy to watch. So in this situation, going into Iraq, um, yeah, we had we had resistance from the people against the government move. Not, you know, obviously it wasn't unified resistance. There was a lot of Americans that like, yeah, cool. In March two thousand three, it was either it was either Pew or Gallup. The biggest poll that was run at the time in March 2003, 74% of Americans supported the war. And that's why you will find you will not find anybody who was of of age at that time. You say, did you support the war in 2003? No. Yeah. It's like funny. That's funny because according to the polls, three out of every four people did. But I cannot find anybody who admit to it now. Well, you talked about the generals and the politicians learning bad lessons from the first Gulf War. So did all of America. Yeah. And all of America said, you know what? Let's go over there and kick some ass. And we, we took the lesson, and our, and our leaders indulged this from Kosovo in the first Gulf War, that war is primarily about liberation and freedom and getting rid of tyranny, and that's what war is primarily about. When war is not primarily about those things, war is about suffering and destruction and death. And... Uh, we let ourselves forget that because of the 90s, because of the way things went in the 90s. And, um, you know, we, we let ourselves forget that to our detriment. Because if we would have gone into the war with clearer eyes, you know, we would have been more prepared for the, sh- <clears throat> you know, for the shock of the violence when it hit us. Yeah, and if you go into war thinking the, the, the thing that I always say is you got to go into war with the, the will. And it's two wills wrapped up in that, the will to kill and the will to die. And if you don't, if you think you're going to go into war and you think you're not going to kill people and by kill people, I mean, you're going to kill civilians, you're going to kill kids. There's going to be, you know, babies murdered or killed by errant bombs and errant machine gun fire. And there's going to be some of your soldiers are going to lose their minds and do some horrible things like that's going to happen. That's going to happen. So if you don't think that's going to happen, you're wrong. 
You, you're wrong. Children died on that first night of bombing you before are, anything went you wrong. You are wrong if you think that. And if you think you can get in and out without taking any casualties on your side, if you think you're not going to be putting American flags over, over caskets, you're wrong. And so, yes, I totally agree that when you come off of you, and it's actually a little escalation in the, in the, uh, in the niceness of war. Cause you go from the Gulf war, we, we took some, we took some casualties in the Gulf war, a lot of more friendly fire, but you know, there was, there was Americans killed, but then you go from that to Kosovo and now you're like, wait a second, we, you, you track the, you track the, uh, trajectory from Vietnam to the Gulf war. And now you're in Kosovo where, uh, hey, we, we can pull this off. And I guarantee there were people thinking, you know what? Okay, we, we maybe we'll, maybe some people will kill, you know, but we'll, we're going to be all right. And there was the provide comfort uh, example where we kind of, you know, we pushed the Iraqi forces back and made room for the Kurds and the Kurds moved in and they, you know, they created our bill as it mm-hmm. is right now, which is a pretty nice place to be, mm-hmm. relatively speaking. And so we, we had this idea that all you got to do is get rid of some of the bad people, break down the bad power structures, the oppressive power structures. You know, there's a I got I, I love trolling my libertarian friends. And uh, I told them that, you know, there was a libertarian streak uh, in the Iraq war planners. And they say, well, what do you mean? We're against war. Yeah, yeah, you're against war. That's fine. But the the impulse, the idea that all we have to do is go in there and get rid of Saddam's regime. And then since that's not there, freedom will break out. Everything will just sort of be, uh, you know, it'll just take over. They'll become Vermont Democrats just Mm -hmm. overnight. And that's not how it works. Um, Freedom is something that exists in a hothouse environment, you know, where order is enforced and security is provided. And, um, you know, I'm always shocked I don't know why I would be. I, I wasn't in a position to have to make these kind of calls back then, obviously. And I hate, uh, you know, I, 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 I always refrain from, like, armchair generalship. And I can't stand people who, who, who do that kind of thing. Um, I get a little resentful and frustrated where I see um, civilians making decisions that seem motivated by politics. Um, but um, it seems like across the board, nobody really expected there to be an insurgency. The civilians didn't expect it. Most of the generals didn't expect it. Some did. Um, some had something to say about it, but they weren't in a position to, uh, you know, to, to, to really have their voices heard. And so we had military leaders who, even then, even still, not expecting a full-blown insurgency, were asking for three or 400,000 troops to secure the country. And uh, they were told, we don't need that many, you know, um, they felt that the war would be politically more difficult to sell if we had to tell people we're sending, you know, 300 or 4,000, 400,000 troops over there. And so we end up going in with one 120, 130, I think, something like that. And the first part of it, it goes the way <clears throat> the first Gulf War went, right? The U.S. military does what it does. There's one thing I want to just before we get too far beyond this. You know, when when you talk about what you think is going to happen, is you create a a create an opportunity for freedom, and freedom's going to break out. That's what's going to happen. Uh, what I think happens is you you have to establish an environment for freedom, and then it's going to take a number of generations for people to be able to. Um, own that freedom and not and and have it flourish because you know when you've had generations so 2003 what we're talking about 20 almost 25 years under this brutal regime regime you got you got people that are absolutely conditioned for you know to to be to be to to fall under the the orders of violence that's what they're conditioned for and and for them, it's like uh, okay, yeah, I'm on board with whatever you want to do, boss. You know, yeah, you know, I I, I recently had uh, Rose Schindler on on my podcast, and you know, she was in, in Auschwitz, an Auschwitz survivor, and th- there was just complete compliance by the Jews. And and if they got told, um, hey, you know, go put your family in the oven, you go put your family in the oven because the alternative was instant death. And and so, how long does it take to for when you do that to generation upon gener generation upon generation? They're not they don't even know what to do when you give them freedom. 
So what you have to do is you have to give them a taste. You have to start, you have to, you have to get them, you have to get them addicted to freedom, right? You have to let, you have to protect it for them. You have to feed it to them. You have to let them eat it. You have to let them grow accustomed to the taste. You have to let them get that taste and, and start to love that taste so much. And that won't happen with the first generation. It's just not gonna happen because they still won't trust it. You have to go to the second generation where those kids are raised like, oh, I can do what I want and I won't have my tongue cut out. And then maybe the third generation where you've got people that are like, hey, you're not gonna take my freedom from me. That, that's what I think. I think it takes that kind, of, that kind of, uh, of, of nurturing of the environment of freedom and getting people conditioned to understand that human beings, as a human being, it's a right that you have. They don't have that attitude. Their attitude isn't, I have a right to freedom. That's not the attitude. And when you give them a glimpse of it, like, hey, like, like when you see um, the troops that pushed up into Baghdad or initially, it was like, they're waving American flags. It's mm-hmm. like, okay. And, and that's why it's there, like the, 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 the seed is there. And you know, you recently saw that in some of the protests in Hong Kong and China where like you, these people are getting this from somewhere. Well, in Hong Kong, it's pretty obvious where they're getting it from. They, they lived as free people for many, many years, but so they still have some of that. But there's a, a seed that exists like in the, in the mind, but it's been so buried by, by fear that you have to do something that's a long-term plan. And that's, what, you know, that's why when you, look at, you know, when you look at Germany and you look at Japan and you look post-World War II, it was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna I don't even know if you can say this, we're gonna impose freedom on you for an extended period of time until that's what you want. Because human beings do, they are, they do want freedom, but sometimes it's just been buried and abused and beat down so hard that the, that it's not worth it to them and they don't understand it. And I think one of the prerequisites to living in a free society is you have to have a population that trusts each other. Um, You know, you had had Sunni, the Sunni minority in control in Iraq for a long time uh, and the the Shia majority and the Kurds had been abused under that system, under Saddam, for a long time. And now you've got to convince the Shiites, who have the votes now under a de- democracy to just take over the government, you've got to convince them not to take revenge on the Sunnis. You've got to teach them why it's a good idea to allow the Sunnis into the government at all after everything that they've been through. You've got to convince the Sunnis to buy into a government that's now going to be led primarily by Shiites. Um, and you, and you gotta, that takes generations, it's generations, you know, it's and, generations and, and in order to do it, um, you know, the first and foremost thing you have to be able to do is you got to provide security in the place. You have to be able to let everybody know that, look, you don't have to go after the Sunnis, Sunnis, you don't have to worry about the Shiites coming after you cause daddy's here. Yep. And, um, you know, when we decided to go in light. And then reinforce that decision by canceling the first cavalry's deployment, uh, pulling the third ID back when we replaced him with the first armor division. Um, for what I believe, I mean, and you know, people can debate about this, and they do, and they will for a long time. For what I think, were political reasons. You know, they didn't. They they didn't. They had been telling everybody that. What, the war, what about those decisions? When when you're talking about what, what about those? So, the military all along had wanted more troops. They said, we need more people to secure yep. this country. Um, eventually, General Franks, CENTCOM general, uh, who was commander of Iraqi forces, uh, of, our, of our forces in Iraq at the time, he finally bought in and he got his subordinate generals to buy in um, to the lower amount under the assumption that they would be reinforced once we knew that Saddam wasn't going to use chemical weapons on us and things like that, that they were going to be reinforced and that we were going to have the Iraqi military and police available to for SASO operations. And just none of those things ended up happening, right? You get up into April, um, I think, yeah, so in, we go in in March 2003. Real, actually, let's back up a little bit. Where, where are you? When did you get out of college? So I graduated college in the spring of 03. Uh, of 03. And you get a platoon. This is, again, why my life has been just awesome. I, I've been so blessed. I... I showed up when I asked for orders to a SEAL team. The guy that I asked for orders to, he, when he, the guy that told me, "You wait," 
when he did give me orders, he gave me orders to the next deploying SEAL team, right? He gave me orders to the next deploying SEAL team. That's a miracle, right? That's, that's, it's a miracle. It's also relationships. It's like also like, you know, I worked hard when I worked for that guy. I worked hard and he, he, he trusted me, you know, and he took care of me. He sent me to the next deploying SEAL team. So it is, I graduate in the spring. So June, July, August, September set for a, set for a September deployment. So I, I go to SEAL Team 7. SEAL Team 5 is on deployment. They got one platoon in Iraq. SEAL Team 5 is on deployment. They're coming home in September. SEAL Team 7 is replacing them. And by the way, not all of SEAL Team 7, just a couple platoons are, actually one platoon is scheduled to go to Iraq. Did you know these guys yet? Who? The, uh, your platoon. Like, did you, it's, no. I know it's a small world. It's but. a small world. Here's the, here's the, the, the really um, lucky things. Mm. The SEAL Team 7 commanding officer was my executive officer when I was at SEAL Team 2. So again, I knew him, I had a great relationship with him, we got along great, he's a great guy. Uh, and so I show up at SEAL Team 7 in, in the spring in of 2003. Spring. Their workup, their pre-deployment workup cycle for civilians out there, you know, you, you train to deploy and the, the deployment training ends long before you go on deployment. It'll end six months before. And then you spend six months doing some kind of fine tweaking. You do a you do what's called, what we used to do, we don't do it anymore, but you do like an operational readiness exercise, a big exercise to prove that you're good to go. And then you do some additional sort of theater-based training, like, okay, we know we're going to this area, we'll do some focus training on that. So the, the main bulk of the workup was done, it was over. By the time you got there. When I showed up. So, I show up and I'm there for a matter of days. And I'm walking, and actually SEAL Team 7 had just been commissioned at the beginning of that workup cycle. So SEAL Team 7's brand new, we don't even have a building yet. So we're wa- I'm walking outside, you know, we, we're, we're, we're kind of thrown into some ad hoc buildings, and so I show up, and the commanding officer, like I said, is a guy that I work for. And so he knew me, and, and and you know, when you work with someone, you know him, you trust him, and I had a great relationship with him, and I'm walking down the hall, and so I check in, and I'm done with my check-in, and and there's one one platoon is slated to go to war. That's you. And no, I'm not even in a platoon. Oh, this is before that. I'm okay. not even in a platoon. Okay, okay. I show up to be ops, I show okay, up to okay. be, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And I'm walking down the hallway, uh, out the external, part of the building and I see the commanding officer and I'm like, hey, what's up, sir? And he goes, Jocko, you look so angry. What are you so angry about? And it's just my face, sir. I said, it's just my face, sir. You know that. <laughs> and he goes, what can I do to make you happy? And I said, give me a one-way ticket to Iraq. And he just smiled. And I was like, well, oh, that's interesting. And looking back, I, I knew, I, looking back, he knew what he was going to do. And what he did was there was a weak platoon commander, and a week after I showed up at SEAL Team 7, he fired that platoon commander and gave me that platoon. How much time do you have to get to know your guys? Uh, a couple months. And uh, what kind of war do you think you're getting into at this point? I don't care. You're just, uh, I, I, you know, whatever. Um, so I mean, we're but you guys got information uh, coming yeah, back so from we, the we're, we're knowing what SEAL Team 5 is doing, yeah. and what they're doing is dream ops yeah. for us. Direct action missions, load up Humvees. So now, now we're thinking about Humvees. Load up Humvees. Go out in the middle of the night, take down a target, grab a bad guy, come back, interrogate him, find out you know what he's doing, get more targets, go hit those targets. It's like a dream come true. What's the op tempo here? I mean, you're talking about nightly missions, like several times the, a week. They're doing, they're doing, you know, th- th- they're doing their op tempo's high. I don't know what the specific numbers are. I would say they're probably doing two, three, four targets a week. Yeah. This is this is glory. This, this is awesome. Like you said, there would be SEALs who would spend their entire 30-year careers be Master Chiefs who would never fire a shot in anger. And these guys are taking down targets. Target after target day. after target. And and not only that, but like I said, we, we trained for a mission. A single mission yeah. would be would be, you know, the, the highlight of my life. Right. And here's guys doing three, four, five, six missions. So I get put in this platoon um, 
and I remember as soon as I took over the platoon, we had a training mission that night. Was it that night? Yes, it was that night. And when I took over the platoon, actually, the, um, the, the commanding officer called me, the offgoing, the guy that was about to get relieved, they called him and the platoon chief into the office, into his office, and we get in there, and he goes, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so, uh, your performance is subpar, and you are hereby relieved. And uh, for, of and Jocko, you are now taking over. And he says, uh, well, how did this go down? Oh, yeah, and he says, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so, you're dismissed. That guy walks out. He says, Chief, I know you. I know um, you know you got a you got a platoon of good guys. You had bad leadership. I should have done this earlier. Whatever he said, I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said, you know, Chief, you got Jocko. And so you asked me if I knew these guys. I knew that guy. Okay. The platoon chief was a buddy of mine from Team One. We kind of one of the guys I grew up with at Teal Team One. That and helps. Yeah. So oh yeah. He, and he had a he had a good relationship with the guys. Yes. So he, he could kind of slide you in. Yeah. 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 Right, and nice. so. So I was excited about that, and the LPO of the sister platoon was like my best friend for well, forever in the teams. So that was really solid too. Uh, the and then the task unit, who ended up being the task unit senior chief, was another like guy that I grew up with at Team One. So yeah, I had some great connections, and that guy was like one of my favorite guys ever. So, so yeah, I'm pretty stoked, man. I mean, I got the commanding officer. I'm super stoked. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. It's awesome. And this is, this is, you know, this you're is, glowing right now. Ah, uh, man. <laughs> this is why, this is why you're in the teams, right? Yeah. This is why you, this is why you work hard. This is why you, this is why you take care of your teammates, right? Because that's all this is. This is like guys that I'd known for you know my whole career, and they're all stoked. I'm coming in. They're freaking stoked. Uh, so the guy, the commanding officer says, see you later to this, to this, he says, Hey, you know, you're fired. And he, then the chief, he says, chief, you know, help with the transition. I, I know you've got some good guys in there. And he says, Roger that. And he goes, all right, um, I'll just, you can, you can go. I'll talk to Jocko. And then the, the platoon chief looks at me and he goes, uh, do you want me to tell, <laughs> do you want me to tell Lieutenant so-and-so anything? And I said, yeah, I said, tell him to get his shit out of my desk. And like, that was that. And I, and sure enough, I, you know, then he left and the commanding officer, you know, we talked for a little while and then I went down and that guy was gone and his shit was out of my desk. And that's when I rolled in. So that night we were doing a training mission and I immediately went in there and I talked to chief and I said, hey, who's the junior guy? Who's, I said, who's a junior guy that like is good to go? And he goes, this guy. And I go, he's gonna run the op tonight. And he was like, what do you mean? I go, he's he's gonna run the op tonight. And he was like, are you sure? And I'm like, yep. So he did, you know, he, this young junior enlisted guy starts putting together the plan. And a couple critical things happened. Um, and this this junior enlisted guy ended up being just a uh, great uh, friend of mine and, and very, very helpful to me because when you build relationships with your junior enlisted guys, they can tell you what's going on, blah, blah, blah. So that night during this mission, we, during this training mission, and, and again, here we are, we're going to Iraq, or we're, we're praying to go to Iraq, and we were slotted, there was two platoons going to CENTCOM. One was gonna be in Bahrain, one was gonna be in Iraq. We weren't sure who was who. Pretty much the other platoon, our sister platoon, and then the plan was to rotate these two platoons. And you'd spend some time in country, and then you know, then you'd go to Bahrain, then you'd switch, right? Okay. Part of that was just the fair ferry, right? Everyone wants to go to war. Yeah. Hey, we're not going to let one platoon get all the experience. So that was part of the plan. So, but still, we know we're going to Iraq, and here we are. We're going on a training mission, and it's like an over the beach pilot rescue or something. Just <laughs> not something we should have been focused on. So, we go, we come over the beach and one of the boats like capsizes and the engine's flooded and it's just a disaster. And luckily for me, I had done a lot of, well, I was, you know, I'd been in the teams for a while and I had done a lot of 
amphibious operations more than normal team guy because I had done two back-to-back ARG platoons, meaning, you know what an ARG is, an amphibious ready group working off of a ship. Like, back in the day, there would be one ARG platoon for every six platoons that would be going on a what we called a spec ops deployment, just going to a land-based deployment. There would be one ARG platoon, and it was always the bad deal, and no one wanted it. And I did two of those back-to-back. And the reason I did two of them back-to-back is because the odds were if you were going to do something real, it was yeah. going to be from the ARG platoon because those were the guys that went to Somalia. And and so I was like, hey, I'm going to do those ARG platoons because those guys are doing real work. Forward deploy at least. So, yeah. so uh, I had done a ton of water work and a ton of over the beaches, more than, more than a normal SEAL, you know, does, especially at that moment in time. So the boat flips, blah, blah, blah. I, the guys are like, the guys are looking at me like, hey, we need to cancel. Like, oh, we need to go admin, basically. Go admin. We got to get a vehicle down here to get this boat back to base. Because what are we going to do? How is this going to work? And I was like, negative. So I kind of just like took over. And I said, here's, hey, here's what we're going to do. Boom. And I gave out the plan. Like, here's, and it's a pretty simple plan. And I, this is the kind of thing I'd done before. You know, you get one guy with the extended bow line. He's going to go out, get through the surf, keep that thing oriented to go through the surf. Everyone else is going to push it out. Once we get in, we're going to paddle this thing. And when I said we're going to paddle this thing out, these guys were looking at me like I was completely insane. Because, you know, you got a 55 horsepower motor on there. It's a big Zodiac yeah, boat. Yeah, sure. But, and it's filled with gear. So it's a pain in the ass. But I know that I can do it because I've done it before. So, but what it, the key is that that they didn't think about too much was somebody being in the holding the bow line of the boat and keeping that boat oriented through the surf, and as long as that's happening, which it's it's not hard to do that because you're like basically a sea anchor. So I say, guys, listen, the bow line the thing needs to be you know kept forward, and we'll just paddle this thing out. Once we get out there, we'll tow because a couple of the other boats were fine, and we just would tow it out once we got out there. So. So here we go. And the guys are like, okay. And I, I remember actually the guy that, the young guy that I had run in the op later, like five years later, he told me like when you, so I was the guy, I was like, okay. I beaned my weapon in the boat, put on my fins and took that bow line and started swimming out. And the guys got in the boat, paddled out, we paddled out through the surf zone, got it hooked up to the other boat. We towed it out. We did our rendezvous at sea. But like five years later, that young guy said to me like, when you made that call, and then we did it. He's like, after that, I, he goes, I would have done anything you ever told me to do because I couldn't believe that it that you said it and then that it worked. So that was like the first like thing I first day. The first day I did. The, the, I think it was that night. Yeah, I think it was yeah. the night that that guy got fired. We did this. Okay. <laughs> and so, and again, I was very lucky because. You know, I had done all these ARG platoons and I was a prior enlisted guy, so I had done multiple deployments and then I did uh, deployments as an officer already. So I, I was very lucky that I had this experience at the time because I certainly was no, you know, certainly no spectacular human by any stretch. So that was that was the first night I meet these guys and, and it did, you know, like you, you mentioned something on one of the earlier podcasts about like bonding together. Well, we did a little bit of a shitty op and it went sideways and we pulled it off. And once we pulled it off, it was like, okay. And then we, we did our final preparation. And then we went on deployment. And finally, Jocko's going to war. Yeah. I think we're up over an hour, so let's wrap it there and leave everybody uh, with a cliffhanger. Right on. Well, Jocko's heading to war. In the meantime, if you want to support this podcast, uh, first of all, Right now, you're probably listening to this podcast on the Jocko podcast feed. We're going to set up this podcast, the thread, on its own standalone, what is it, podcast feed? It'll be its own standalone podcast. So if you want to keep listening to it, subscribe to it. And then if you want to support this podcast, you can also check out our other podcasts. I got a podcast called Jocko Podcast. I got the Warrior Kid Podcast, and I got the Grounded Podcast. And Daryl has a podcast, which is called Martyr Made. And if you want to support any of these podcasts, you can go to a place called JockoStore.com, and you can get some gear. Or you can go to OriginMain.com, and you can get some gear there. That's all I got. Thanks for listening. As things unravel, this is Jocko and Daryl. Out.